Breton, taking his cue from the artist's iconography of objects encountered in the modern city, which included rubber gloves, tailor's dummies and eyeglasses combined with works of classical statuary, saw de Chirico's paintings, as well as that of his brother Alberto Savinio, as the harbinger of a new modern mythology based on uncanny juxtapositions of objects. However, in the mid-1920s, by which time de Chirico's work began to make explicit references to more traditional painting, Breton subjected the painter to a savage critique for producing, among other things, ridiculous copies of Raphael. That's a quote from Breton. If the leader of the Surrealists was any judge, at any at least, the primary Surrealist painter in Italy was no longer worthy of that description. And this, of course, was the period of the call to order in the art world in many parts of Europe, including Italy where, along with the rise of fascism, there had been attempts to produce a modern art more in harmony with tradition that had, than had been the case with the avant-garde. In this climate, surrealism came under attack at official levels, as in, for example, the Italian journal Critica Fascista in 1926, where surrealism was discussed unfavourably in the same terms as pederasty and satanism. And in 1930, when the artist, critic and cultural official Cifriano Eficio Oppo disparagingly described surrealist in thinly veiled racist terms as a movement, quote, that reminds us of Berlin and Paris also through Israel, end of quote. Although such viewpoints might seem to ring the death knell, really, for surrealism in Italy under the conditions of totalitarianism, recent studies have shown there was an extraordinary diversity of avant-garde practice under fascism, which included representatives of most avant-garde movements, not just futurism, but also expressionism and abstract art. And several writers and artists in Italy were well aware of the activities of the French surrealists and incorporated certain of their ideas into their work. In this paper, I want to explore the influence of surrealist ideas on one artist, Scipione, in a series of drawings and paintings mostly dated to the year 1930. Scipione has often been described as a surrealist, both during his lifetime and in the literature on the artist in more recent times. To take just one example, Corrado Paolini commenting in 1930 on the artist's, quote, strange and very poetic painting, end of quote, uh, one called Dreamers, for example, which I'm not showing you here, which featured an orangutan and a parrot. And Pavolini described, uh, in a review of that work, he described Shibriani as a surrealist of great intelligence. Quoting a contemporary critic there. And there are lots of, I won't go into all of the sort of commentary about him as a surrealist, but uh, because I actually am going to argue that he's not a surrealist, uh, in the French model at least. And the reason for, I say this is because he never employed a lot of the avant-garde devices that we find in surrealism, such as automatism. Uh, he didn't use collage or abstraction or a whole lot of other uh, techniques often associated with the French uh, movement. Moreover, in a number of caricatures, drawings and paintings, Chipione gently mocks the surrealists. Here's the mannequin painter, pretty slight work, uh, sketch essentially, um, which you see here a painter actually using a mannequin as the model, um, which really uh, strips this sort of uncanny figure of its mystery turn, turning it into a kind of banal pedestrian uh, form of realism. In uh, another caricature, uh, which was called To the True Surrealism, and again of 1930, published in the Italia Letteraria, he also produced light-hearted catalogues of figures from surrealist art, including the work of Savinio, Di Chirico, Jean Miro, and Salvador Dali. And it was caricatures like this that led Di Chirico to comment in the press that the artist's caricatures were directed against him. In another drawing uh, titled Opening of the Season, the models arrived from Paris. This is just to give you a sense of you know, Chibiones appreciation and understanding of surrealist culture uh, at the same time as his distance from it. Uh, he compared the writings and artworks of a range of French writers and artists, 
including several closely associated with the Surrealists, to the contemporary fashion cycle for women's clothing. In spite of the artist's evident irreverence towards Surrealism, I argue today that in several of his representations of sexuality and of urban space, should be on a drew upon ideas that were shared in common by the Surrealists or the works of those who had inspired them. As we know from contemporary accounts by those who associated with the artists during the late 1920s and early 30s, Shibione was part of a circle of artists and writers who had read the writings of Lotriamont, Tikirico, Savinio, Breton, Rimbaud, Cocteau and others who either belonged to the Surrealist movement, had inspired it, were fellow travellers, or were receptive to Surrealist ideas, albeit at one remove from the city of Paris, where the movement was largely centred during the 1920s. Among the ideas that Chibane drew from these and other artists and writers' work, the idea of hybrid figures, including hermaphrodite, and the idea of urban space as a site for marvellous encounters, would be the most prominent ones with the closest relation to Surrealist thinking. So first I'll speak about the double and the hermaphrodite in Chibnani's work. As Giuseppe Abella first noted in 1984 in his important study of the artist's drawings, several works in Chipulone's oeuvre show double or hybrid figures. This is where I get to point at bits of people's anatomy, so here we go, <laughs> just in case you missed it. For example, in Adam and Eve, 1925, the biblical couple are both depicted, I think, as women, one with male genital organs, however, sure how clear that is, but um, is it possible to bring the lights down at all? Some of these images are sort of faint. You could bring down like my spot if you want. Oh, I'll just keep talking. Um, and Achilles <coughs> his days, a drawing you see here on the right, shows a double-headed figure uh, hovering above a river, which is depicted down here, there's a little boat. Um, well, it's more of this, perhaps you... <laughs> Some more of these that you need to bring. That's a beautiful now. That's perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So now you can see. Did you see it? There we go. I'll just point it out again. Uh, there's this double headed figure uh, moving right along. Um, uh, and um, one of the heads um, is attached to a woman's body down here. Uh, but uh, we understand the other head is really that of a man and it joined at the ear, which is sort of facing directly. Very, you know, bizarre sort of metamorphosic kind of images. Another image in, where there's a kind of double or hybrid figure, very famous and uh, quite impressive painting by Scipione called The Awakening of the Blonde Siren. Uh, we see a part human and part fish figure depicted with a kind of two-sided face. However, without doubt, the most striking image of the double or hybrid figure in Chibione's work is his drawing Hermaphrodite of 1930, in which the viewer comes face to face with a pronounced sexual ambiguity. There are several sources, of course, for the concept of the hermaphrodite in ancient art, philosophy, and mythology, including the Roman sleeping hermaphrodite, which you see here, think of Ovid's Metamorphosis, and the writings of Plato, from which an artist like Scipione could have drawn upon for his image. However, by stripping the image of its classical or mythological justifications and surrounding it with the trappings of modern life, including women's clothing, uh, a vanity table with an ostrich feather, uh, and a photograph, Scipione denuded the figure of its nobler, classicising or mythologising veils. Moreover, the hermaphrodite adopts a pose seen frequently in representations of naked women in both high and low art, I'm referring to the arms raised in a gesture seemingly justified by the act of adjusting hair or removing a garment, but which is largely intended to expose the body to a full and complete display. <laughs> Unlike more conventional female moods, however, the woman's gesture, which gives the impression that the figure has short hair, involves a strong grip of one arm on the other. And 
this is as if the figure were involved in a kind of athletic muscle stretching movement. And the figure sports uh, a penis and testicles, has abundant dark coloured pubic and underarm hair. In this sense, it's radically different to the work of another famous Italian painter who employed the motif of the hermaphrodite in his work, namely Carlo Cola, whose strangely gender neutral figure in a painting such as Hermaphroditic Idol of 1917 should be only here explicitly sexualises. Another possible source for Scipione's hermaphrodite are the writings of authors who had inspired the Surrealist movement, such as the Comte de Lautriamont, which Scipione had access to in this period. Lautriamont's hermaphrodite, described in the songs of Maldoror, incorporates aspects of both masculinity and femininity, and experiences a strong sense of self-splitting. At one point in Lautriamont's narrative, the hermaphrodite Quote, feels his body split in twain from head to foot, end of quote. Amy Lyford, in her analysis of the relation between La Tremont and the Surrealists in France, has argued for the importance of the hermaphrodite figure for the movement. As she writes, <coughs> the hermaphrodite's ambiguous sexual identity foregrounds both physical and psychological fragmentation in ways that parallel the themes that the Surrealists were exploring in the 1920s and 30s, including the heterogeneous bodily forms resulting from the game of exquisite corpse. And the game of exquisite corpse, I'm just ending that quote from Amy Life. And now, uh, for those of you <clears throat> not familiar with this genre of Surrealist art, uh, several people are involved in producing a drawing together, and it's done by basically folding a piece of paper into four or five panels, one person draws on one, uh, and then they pass it on to the next person who doesn't see what the other person has drawn, and so on. So you get this kind of disjunctive, uh, collectively produced image. And in Alberto Savino's writing, also familiar to Shibiana in this period, including his early Hermaphrodito of 1917, and other works such as La Casa Isperata, published as a book in 1925, the writer, that is to say Savinio, was obsessed with the double-sexed figure, and it played various roles in his writing. In 1925, the doubling of sex could be a source of horror to Savinio, similar to the threat of castration. Elsewhere in his writing, the hermaphrodite figure comes to stand for a challenge to rigid gender binaries, what Kiala Jewell has described as an attempt to favour difference and multiplicity over illusory repressive ideas handed down from the past. Such depictions of mixed gender were in pointed opposition to traditional gender roles and, in particular, to a recurrent preoccupation in Italy and elsewhere in the first decades of the 20th century that saw condemnation of emancipated women who rejected the role of wife and mother, refused marriage and took on active work. As an indication of contemporary attitudes, and this type of woman was once described in Italy in 1910 as, quote, the amphibian of the human world, end quote. And Savinio's often grotesque and even abject depictions of hermaphroditism involving giving birth through the anus walk a fine line between promoting difference and reinforcing its negation. Scipione's drawing, though, to return to our subject, However, it has to be distinguished, I think, from the more abject kind of fragmentation and, and uh, reorganisation of the body witnessing the exquisite corpse, that surrealist parlour game turned art genre, with its devastating reorganisation of the human form, and in Savinio's writings, so I'm saying Scipione is quite different to both of them. The emphasis in Scipione is not on monstrosity, but rather on the surprising appearance of male sexual organs in a context otherwise strongly marked both <coughs> biologically and culturally as female. The breasts, the pin-up pose, the button-up boots, which are there on the floor, the corsets and frilly undergarments. In other words, the gender mixing here takes place not to emphasise the monstrous, but rather to make us accept it as if it were perfectly natural, with the delicate contours of the pubic region is simulated to the whimsical facility of the artist's draftsmanship. 
What did you do tonight, honey? Well, we talked about the genitals and drawings. <laughs> Back to my pet paper. <laughs> she only wanted to produce a modern analogue for the kind of ideal beauty associated with androgyny and even hermaphroditism, such as that encountered in the neoclassical aesthetics of Winkelmann. He achieves this by producing a hybrid figure who, far from being abject and lying completely outside existing codes of representation, nestles within the idealising, classicising canon while simultaneously remaining foreign to it. In other words, we could describe this work as a form of queer beauty or as an aesthetic which has parallels, as Silvia Loretti has argued, with Breton's idea of convulsive beauty one which conforms to the surrealist project to pervert established aesthetical norms in order to demolish traditional psychic and behavioural patterns. I think this is particularly true in the case of Shibuono's drawing, which was created at a time when divisions of gender were becoming more pronounced in the late 1920s and early 30s, after Mussolini's rise to power and the reinforcement of the idea of a militant male and a fecund mother producing large families for the good of the state. Scipione was very well aware of this and later, after having produced a drawing, requested that a publisher not reproduced it. He described such drawings as, quote, more sensual or pornographic, for example, the hermaphrodite, end of quote, and he asked the publisher to withdraw uh, this drawing and some others from a planned volume for fear of running into trouble with the Italian censors, or at least so Shibione uh, commented in a letter. But there's one proviso I want to make <coughs> to this argument about the drawing as a subversion of contemporary mores, you know, which is what us, our historians who work on the avant garde, really like to think all the time and so radical. Well, <coughs> how about this? The image of the fascist state and of Mussolini himself, in spite of the intense gender divisions of Italian society, was at times actually promoted as being open to what we might call hermaphroditic or androgynous tendencies. As Luisa Passerini has argued, and this is in an interview with Harlan Mergen, who's sitting here in front of us, uh, Mussolini sought to bring together the two extreme versions of gender identity produced under fascism in an extraordinary fusion whereby the dictator, and now I quote Passerini, tried in a perverse way to perform a connection between male and female. Mm -hmm. quote. Through various means, including arguing that he was the mother of the nation, that one must love the fatherland with the same purity of sentiment as one loves one's mother, and reminding children that the letter M, which stood for Mussolini, also stood for mother. The dictator sought symbolically to compensate for the divisions, perhaps, between genders through a gesture of gender unity. It is perhaps the same peculiar mixture of male and female elements in fascist ideology that led the Italian author Carlo Emilio Agarda after World War II to comment wryly on the peculiar obsession with virility under Mussolini. And here's a quote that many of you will know, I think. He said this. Everything then was male and martial, even broads and wet nurses and the tits of your wet nurse, and the ovary and fallopian tubes and the vagina and the vulva, the virile vulva of the Italian woman. That's the end of the quote from Gatta. Pretty out there. In this sense, Scipione's hermaphrodite image I'm suggesting related both to ancient art and literature, but also to the surrealist canon, can be seen as embodying a peculiar gender hybridity which stood at the core of the image of the state and the leader in fascism. Okay, on to urban space in Rome, We're taking the temperature down a bit, a little bit. Another aspect of Shibano's work that can be connected to ideas common to the Surrealists is his depictions of urban space in Rome. You're looking at a series of prints by the artist showing you some famous scenes. And there are lots of these, there are drawings and paintings in the same theme. They show various public spaces in the historical centre of the Italian capital, showing us what appear to be, at first glance, fairly conventional depictions of famous tourist sites, familiar to any visitor to the city today, including St. Peter's and the Vatican, Piazza Navona, the Colosseum, the Arch of Constantine, 
Trajan's Forum via Appia, and then on to Sant'Angelo. However, on closer inspection, the images are far from straightforward, and we'll inspect them more closely in a minute. Many of the images show uninhabited spaces, strangely bereft of human activity, while others are the setting for peculiar, even grotesque figures. And yet others show statues taking off from their pedestal and launching into the air, or painted in a manner which suggests that they are somehow alive. Can we understand these images in relation to the contemporary experience of urban space in Rome and to the French Surrealist tradition? Well, let's see. I've not turned up any evidence to indicate whether or not the dissident Surrealist publication document ever reached Italy in this period. However, it is interesting to speculate whether Shibiano may have been aware of Robert Desnos's article, Pygmalion and the Sphinx, published in that journal in early 1930, where a bronze sculpture is described as literally taking flight. However, I'm on firmer ground, I think, in arguing that there is a likely connection to the Surrealists in this regard, and it's through the work of André Breton. Like so many artists and writers before and after him, Shibione loved to roam the streets, both during the day and at night. And I wish I was there, because they just, I think, used to get totally drunk. And they'd hire a carriage and just go roaming around and sing at the tops of their voices and you know, talk about art for our lives. It's exactly the sort of thing I don't have the energy to do anymore because I'm too old. But once upon a time. Friends of the artists have frequently pointed out Paintings themselves by Scipione, which we'll be looking at in a minute, were sometimes painted the day after a particular midnight jaunt, just like this, through the city of Rome. In this, Scipione was similar to Breton and the Surrealists, for whom aimless wandering through the streets in search of marvellous encounters was central to their representations of the metropolis. This aspect of Surrealist practice was recorded in the novel Nadja of 1928 by Breton, a copy of which we know Shibione had received from the poet and critic Leonardo Sinisgalli in 1930, along with a copy of De Chirico's Hebdomados and Potomac by Jean Cocteau. These were all exchanged for a drawing which Sinisgalli got in return. Nadja, the story of Breton's encounter with a woman he meets more or less by chance, takes the narrator through various locations in the city, like a flanner strolling the sidewalk along the lines of Charles Baudelaire. Of particular interest in the book, for Scipione, both in the text and in photographic images taken by Jacques Contre Boifard, would have been the depiction of public squares, like the Place de Pantheon, the Place Maubert, the Porte Saint-Denis, and the Tuileries. While Breton's urban arena was the city of Paris, Scipione's would be that of Rome. One aspect of Scipione's depictions of Rome with strong connections to Nadja and Surrealism more generally is his representations of urban sculptures. Two works, Piazza Navona and The Bridge of Angels, show public sculpture either actually in flight or possessed of an extraordinary, almost diabolical dynamism. In the Bridge of Angels up here, which depicts uh, at the bridge which crosses the Tiber and leads to the Castello Sant'Angelo, Scipione shows a Gian Lorenzo Benini sculpture literally taking flight off the bridge here. You can just make it out uh, rising above the city there. Piazza Navona, down here, shows an area of the Baroque Roman city very familiar to tourists. In the foreground is the Moor Fountain with its sculpture by Bernini, surrounded by tritons uh, by Giacomo della Porta. In the background is Bernini's Fountain of the Four Rivers, you can just make out there, uh, and to the left, Bottomini's church, Sant'Agnese in Agone. In this painting, Chabot has added flaming red touches of paint to the serpentine movement of the Baroque sculptures by Della Porta and Bernini, making them seem to almost literally come alive. Through, although the curvaceous forms of the sculptures are set apart from the zooming perspective of the, of the piazza, 
The crimson and orange tonality, which covers the whole work, fails to adequately distinguish figure from setting and connoted, at least for one contemporary critic, and here I quote, an enormous rotten melon corrupted by time, end of quote. Pretty amazing description. Both animate and inanimate, alive and decaying, these sculptures realise the Baroque idea of conveying movement while troubling that sensation of dynamism in Chiverdani's paintings with their suggestions of decomposition, linking them to a surrealist tendency to find the spectacle of public sculpture in the city a source both of fascination but also of unbearable discomfort. And that's to quote a passage from Breton's Nature. The locales that Scipione sought out were more recognised for their ancient and classical monuments than those which feature in Nadja. However, even though these places in Rome are overpopulated with ancient and Renaissance era buildings, there were also some major demolition and reconstruction works going on in the city which would change the face of the capital forever and make it the site of exactly the kind of astonishing and marvellous occurrences that Breton celebrated in his surrealist novel. In a speech of 1925, authorising the mayor of Rome to undertake a new urban planning scheme, Mussolini painted a verbal picture of what the new fascist Rome was to look like. And here I quote, In five years, Rome must appear marvellous to all the peoples of the world, vast, orderly, powerful as it was in the time of the first empire of Augustus. And further to this, Mussolini added, and here's a longer quote from Mussolini, you will open up the space around the theatre of Marcellus, the Capitoline and the Pantheon. Everything that has grown around them during the centuries of decadence must disappear. Within five years, a great passage from Piazza Colonna must make the monument of the Pantheon visible. You will also free the majestic temples of Christian Rome from the parasitic and profane constructions. The millennial, millennial monuments of our history must loom in the required isolation. That's the end of the quote from Mussolini. <coughs> Mussolini's ambition here was to emphasise the grandeur of Rome by removing the memory of the most recent past. That is to say, the entire 19th century liberal era. Moreover, this emphasis on classical history was accompanied by a social hygiene imperative which dovetailed with new social controls seeking to regulate the behaviour of the populace. And here's one more longish quote, this time from the historian Nicholas Fife. Quote, Fascist women were not supposed to enjoy the freedom of the streets. In 1923, prostitutes had been subjected to a program of regulation which sought to control sexualities which lay beyond the familial units advocated by fascism. Three years later, under the nascent dictatorship, the new public security laws legislated for the eviction of all prostitutes from the streets. Planners and sociologists talked of treating the city and correcting its maladies. They wanted to excise the dangerous elements from the metropolis to leave a healthy, ordered, disciplined and fertile fascist city. That's the end of the quote from Nicholas Fyke, giving a sense of the sort of urban planning, uh, it combined with other forms of population control that went hand in hand with uh, Mussolini's idea of uh, knocking down some of the more recent buildings around the classical monuments. So although demolitions and the rebuilding of entire areas of Rome was a slow process, which took mostly took place during the 1930s, proposals for urban reorganisation along the lines set up by Mussolini were made public beginning in the 1920s. And actual demolitions had begun in various parts of Rome from 1926. That was the year that saw the beginning of the uh, construction of the Via del Mare in the Campidoglio and around Trajan's Forum uh, to reveal Trajan's markets. One of Scipione's most frequently depicted sites was Trajan's Forum. And we have concrete evidence 
that he, along with other artists, witnessed the demolitions which were taking place there in drawings which show scaffolding uh, and also workers removing debris. Now, I don't have the uh, with me the one where we see the workers in the Shibano drawing, but we can see, it's a little bit hard to read, I suppose, uh, and you have to bear in mind these drawings are about the size of this piece of paper, so it's very misleading that they're so inflated. But the good thing is that it helps you to see uh, that these are the scaffolding pipes, or, you know, that were being constructed as they're ripping the building down. You see some more here, and from Mario Barroso, we see the same shot basically and you can see i don't know how clear that is but there's a kind of quadrilateral shape there which is scaffolding which is the same here so these images are done almost at exactly the same time but there are there are others by both artists showing the demolitions at a lesser or greater uh state of advancement and you can just see in the bottom here there are some carriages with workers you know pulling away the the debris as the buildings around the trajan's market are being pulled down <clears throat> so, Shibuya's interest in this particular site uh, and others like it, where demolitions were going on, show us that Oppo was correct to argue in 1935 when he wrote an essay for the posthumous uh, exhibition of Shibuya in the Quadrinale in 1935 that Shibuya, quote, painted a Rome that was on the verge of disappearing. The effect of these massive urban transformations on the local inhabitants was substantial. Aristotle Callus argues that when demolitions at the very heart of Rome started in earnest at the end of the 1920s, they produced new empty spaces that invited new, sometimes wild, creative ideas. That's the end of the quote from Callus there. Later in the decade, uh, many commentators would reflect, actually, on the disorientation produced by these demolitions. And these uh, reflections have prompted uh, Paul Baxo, who's written uh, extensively on the uh, process of these demolitions and the reconstruction of Rome, uh, to remark that the effect of the demolitions was to, quote, disrupt the memory of Romans, make what was once for me strange, and thus challenge long-held beliefs about the city. End of quote. So this is now I've painted a picture of the kind of setting of the various studies uh, of Trojan's Forum of 1930 by Shibione. Shibione records various stages of the demolition of the building, um, which correspond, as I was saying earlier, to other representations of the same site around the same time. Mm -hmm. Contemporary, here's a photograph. Uh, tiny bit earlier of the same site. We're looking um, from a different direction. So here we're looking over Trajan's Forum at the buildings there that would be uh, concealing Trajan's Market. Um, but here we're sort of looking from, I suppose, Trajan's Market back over to the um, Trajan's Forum there. So on your right we have a drawing uh, of a work called Roman, a drawing called the Roman Prostitute by Shibione, and I'll show you the painting of the same view, the same painting, uh, the same topic uh, directly after this. The drawing shows, the one on the right, a woman standing near to Trajan's Forum, at precisely the place where the demolitions were taking place. And I think, you know, you have to think that really where she's standing is precisely, you know, where, more or less, where the site of a lot of these images is taking place and right really in the midst of uh, these demolitions here, you know, which would have to be somewhere about. I mean, obviously it's artistic license, but you know, this is the imagined location. And my point is not that she's standing exactly in a particular place, but she's in this zone. The artist and the figure, because you have to think the artist is sort of in there as well, are as it were standing in the midst not only of ancient ruins, but of modern ones. The woman stands in front of the tall cylinder of the Roman triumphal Trajan's column, which was completed in AD 113. And that column is flanked on either side by the bulging round cupolas of two churches, uh, one completed in the 16th century and the other finished in the 18th century, one on either side. For those of you who know that square, be familiar with that uh, landscape. In front of the column stand the broken remnants of the 
forum or around it. Really. The figure of the prostitute who is dressed in a 19th century costume, notably outmoded for the 1930s, <laughs> with her abundantly flowing auburn hair, her neck choker, her frilly petticoats and elaborate jewellery, strides onto, in a drawing, a vast empty space that signifies the missing modern buildings surrounding the forum. As is well known, the prostitute has a complex significance in European culture historically. In French literature, the prostitute had for several decades signified modernity, the commodification of sexuality, but also of culture more broadly, the independence of women from sexual and social mores, and the reign of appearances in the modern city, just to pick up a handful of uh, this kind of complex signification of the figure of the prostitute in French um, literature. However, in this case, the location of the depiction strongly connects the image to the fascists' demolitions of modern buildings intended to return Rome to a former grandeur, and to their related attempt to clear the streets of what they might have described as human rubble, such as prostitutes and others the fascists considered undesirable. In the process, Rome was made strange, though, to its inhabitants. This figure of absence in its old-fashioned style of dress refers both to the disappearance of the prostitute from the streets of Rome and to the evacuation of the buildings that had built up over the years around the ancient monuments upon which Rome was built. There's a painting uh, in a collection in Milan. It's in pretty poor condition, as you can see. Um, that's very close to the drawing. Um, and so I'm going to spend a bit of time looking now at this painting. The uncanny dimensions of this return of the repressed in the drawing and the painting of the same title are subtle but are there to see. <laughs> Whether in the mismatched shoes she's wearing a boot, maybe it's easy to see in the drawing she's wearing a boot on one foot and a sort of uh, pump or a stiletto on the other. And of course, footwear is associated very closely in Freudian psychoanalytic theory with a fetishistic substitute for a traumatic perception of lack. Don't forget, and I'm talking about this figure as an image of lack, as an image of absence, as an image of evacuation, and some of the emotions that might be associated with that. Another un uncanny dimension of this return of the repressed, of the sort of suppressed or evacuated prostitute, uh, is also the lace handkerchief which the figure holds up. Where does she hold it up? She seemingly holds it up to Trajan's column, drawing attention to a smaller truncated column which visually abuts it. You can also see that somewhat here, although the association between the handkerchief and the sort of truncated column is not as extreme as it is in this one. The profound sense of unease presented by the uncanny return of this figure who seems to float like a spectre before the viewer is one of the things registered, I think, in many comments on Shibiano's paintings from this period that stress distasteful comparisons. Contemporary critics described his works as, quote, anti-hygienic and <laughs> anti-digestive, end of quote, and as a form of, quote, pictorial dysentery, end of quote. <laughs> Now that kind of language later, particularly in the 30s, would become kind of commonplace of you know, very extreme fascist views about all modern art. But I think there's a certain particular kind of intestinal uh, disturbance which goes on in, in the commentary on a lot of these paintings. And I think it has to do with this sort of perception of the, the uh, alienation, the strangeness and the peculiarity of what was happening to urban space and, and the kind of treatment of sexuality in Rome in this period. I'm arguing essentially what Shigiano is giving us here in the Roman prostitute is an apparition born from a city undergoing convulsive, even stomach churning changes. This returning ghost belongs to the panoply of mysterious and unpredictable women who haunted the surrealist imagination, here transplanted to Italy. In making these connections between Scipione and Surrealism, today I want to stress that I don't count the artist as being among the Surrealists. I think that's going too far. But rather I consider that certain ideas of that movement 
in particular uh, the notion of hybridity and the urban environment as a sexualized, uncanny space were filtered through various channels in the 1920s and 1930s and emerge in Shipiano's work during this period. In saying this, I've also wanted to argue that surrealism itself was dispersed beyond its centre in Paris to a place with little active history of surrealist visual culture and that in the process it would virtually become unrecognisable while continuing the work nevertheless of challenging conventional mores begun by the French founders of the movement. Thank you, that's all I have to say. questions and, um, and one comment. Um, I suppose the, well, sort of a common question is that the, in terms of hermaphroditism and, and Mussolini and um, the Luisa Passerini um, comment, I mean, to what extent, I, I've always thought of that as, um, as an acceptable, as acceptable in its seeming absurdity because I believe in, the, in that instance or elsewhere, Pasolini qualifies it by saying that, of course, this combination of absurd polarities, male and female, is allowed to the Duce alone in a, in a phantasmatic imaginary sense. And that, that that is permitted to him only by means of this um, already deeply charged sexual relationship between the body politic and the iduce that is allowed to him and him alone, and so, I mean, I, I don't necessarily, I don't think that you were arguing that, that you know that this instance of her hermaphroditism was okay because you know be, because of that. Um, oh God, could I do that? Um, but <laughs> no, right. um, no, no. so I guess that's the um, that's the first first sort of query. And um, the second is, you, you trace a very, I mean, it's fascinating that he was given this copy of Nadia. Um, and as you uh, very aptly discuss, you know, the, the Breton reproduces the Porte Saint-Denis, which is also, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, reproduced in Corbusier's Towards New Architecture. So it's one of these sort of subtle pro prods and um, a kind of passive aggressive stab in some ways at. Um, not simply this free-floating psychological <coughs> sexual exploration of the city, but over and against specifically this rationalist city that mm -hmm. is trying to be erected in the legacy of Haussmann and et cetera. So do you trace in, I mean, in tracing a parallel with uh, Breton and Nadia, do you think that Scipioni is trying, in a sense, to reclaim this irrational Rome as something that can be saved from the bulldozers of, of Mussolini's you know, Terza Roma and this rationalized space of, um, uh, that's, the, that's mm -hmm. the second one. And then the last one is that I, I like your ending because I think, I do think it is important to, I don't think you need, um, in a sense, uh, surrealism for Scipione to the extent that, um, you know, from beginning to end, I think you underscored it, that surrealism in Italy is just, it's inevitably, it just doesn't take root, really. and. Um, you know, even in that 1940s something issue of Prospettiva, yeah, where they uh, talk about surrealism, mm -hmm. um, and he's long, long dead by then. But um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it does seem like it's something different entirely. But um, that's anyway, a, yeah. I know that's a lot to. No, that's good. That those are all very valuable questions, and I'm, I'm really. Um, I mean, you've, you've actually hit on a couple of things that I, I was worried about. Mm. And so that's great. Thank you. Um, so, in regard to the first comment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my understanding from what I've read of Passerini's work, uh, not just the interview I mentioned, but um, other works where she makes all these claims. Uh, so first of all, the, the argument that I'm making really is sort of, I'm always extremely wary of, of ever saying, you know, this artist is clearly right. resisting or negating or challenging some sort of, you know, cultures, because it's, 
it's problematic. So I'm always interested in looking for how one might be able to confound or complicate that story. Mm -hmm. So one of the motivations for using Passerini in this instance is to, I suppose, to complicate that. And I certainly don't at all think, um, you know, that obviously it was something that, yes, as you say, and that's Passerini's argument, that it's only allowed to Mussolini, and it's a kind of, yes, it's just something absurd about it. And I, I suppose I haven't clarified to my audience today, and even to myself, really, what I think that means, you know, that, to make that comparison. And I suppose at this moment I'll just take a very minimalist position and I'm just opening the, uh, the question that it's really, you know, too simplistic to kind of see it as a, just a simply challenging image because if there right. was this phantom-like kind of sense of hermaphroditism circulating in the culture, um, we, we need to think about that. The second thing, just to keep on the point of hermaphroditism, I need to double check and go back again to check with the archives just when those statements by Muslim were being made because I have a feeling that stuff might be happening a little bit later than this and I need to double check that. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's just another thing. So that might invalidate my argument essentially. But the, the Gadda seems to bear upon this even infinitely more than necessarily the Mussolini. I mean, yeah. and that stirs up the question of, of biography. I mean, to what extent do you want to bring to bear Scipione's own kind of I mean, what do we know about his own sexual life or erotic life or its relationship to the, to the fascist imaginary of the period? Is it one that is, you know, intentionally or obliquely being, uh, trying to be subversive in terms of sexuality? Or is it, um, I mean, to what extent do you, I mean, not that we have to, that biography needs to be the methodological tack, but it does seem, I mean, I want to know more about his, his kind of psychic and erotic life and how that's, um, I mean, he's in his 20s here, right? And mm -hmm. these are these paintings. I mean, even comparable as he is to someone like Mafai at the time. I mean, these these are there's nothing comparable to these in the in the 30s. I mean, you have the Corrado Cagli. All you know, it's mostly naked men actually. Well, that's in the right. 30s. There's a lot of them <laughs> in yeah. Italian art this time. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but uh, you know, there's a. I mean, I could talk about Chapelle's personal life, and I would, and, and I've been asked this question before, and in fact. One person commented on this that um, it's very significant that one of the characters in this uh, train of, of literary figures, Thibaudot, I don't know if any Thibaudet, I don't think if, if anybody knows him, but he was the lover of one of the others there. And, mm. and my colleague suggested that it was quite noteworthy that, um, you know, there's very little known figure is sort of getting a mention in this, mm. um, in this humorous caricature. All the indications from the literature and from the evidence that suggests is that he was just Chibrani was just a lad, mm. um, you know, and you know, uh, unconventional sexuality. I mean, really, for a man of his age, I think at that time, not really. Um, but um, it, it's it's something that you know I could look into, but I don't know whether you know. It, I'm, I think it, I'm not much will come out of it, but it is interesting mm. to speculate about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As regards to Pont Saint Denis, the other thing there is, oh, uh, thanks for the reference about Le Corbusier, yes, I haven't con considered that. There's another work which I ha don't have with me today, which is called, um, I forget what it's called, but it shows the Vatican before they knocked down the Borgo, mm. you know, there, and there's the, the um, Saint Peter or the Pope. Yeah, because in, think, in one of the images it says, it doesn't say Via della Conciliazione, it says La strada che porta a yeah, uh, San Pietro. Uh, San Pietro, yeah. that one there. Yeah, oh, there's yeah, a drawing yeah. version of it. So it's quite an interesting painting which I've seen in Rome. And, um, you know, these demolitions, you know, they were talking about that Via della Conciliazione mm. in the 1920s. And mm. by 1929, I mean, there was a letter of pact and I think there was some deal, you know, they said, well, you know, it's okay, but, you know, Here's a demolition you're allowed to do, or whatever. So, there, I don't know how much you would have known, but certainly Italian scholars like to talk about Chibane's work of this period as being all about, you know, those demolitions, which you know hadn't happened yet, and and wouldn't happen until after he was dead. So, there, but there is a weird way in which the 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 the, the road that goes to San Pietro. In the painting version, you can't see it very clearly here at all. But you know, St. Peter's just sort of the dome just sort of popping up mm. out of the background, and it's really good. There's a sort of sense in which um, the discussion around this work, in particular the painting version, uh, is that you know, this is kind of Baroque chinography which is going on in, in his work at this time, which is quite opposed to the rationalist 
uh, house modernisation at the moment that's going on. So, I mean, that's definitely in there, and I think that's something that, you know, I just haven't got around to really working. I just have to really, again, check how much would he have known, how much could he have known. You know, I know when exhibitions about what destructions were going to be done, when would be, so when he would have known, it would have been being discussed. So, yeah. right. And as for surrealism, yes, well, I, I mean, I totally agree with you, I think. Because he's often spoken about as an expressionist, I just thought it would be interesting to think mm. about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, that was a long answer, sorry. Uh, just a quick question. How, how he was so young when he died, what, what, uh, why, how did he die? But what we discussed the other night. The, the, the uh, Chicchioni, how yeah, did he die? Yeah, um, Paul Mead, what do you call it? It's, it's like tuberculosis yeah. or oh. consumption. Oh, really? So he, he spent um, about 50% of his life between in the last 18 months or two years of his life between Rome and Arco, which is up in the uh, Alto Adige or Trentino. He was, you know, he went to the mountains to get the cure for the lung disease he had. And he died of this lung disease. He had these big scars on his lungs and he just... He was so young. You know? Yeah, well he had, is it tuberculosis or consumption? Pulmonary TB, yeah. That's it, that's it, thank you. Young people got that. Yeah, and you know he, he was very really fit, quite robust sort of character. I mean, you look at him, and mm. you know he wasn't some kind of um, like me, some kind of you know, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, sickly <laughs> child. <laughs> <you know. laughs> he was a bomb star. Well, he he was quite an athletic guy, apparently. So anyway, um, so he died young because of that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the reason. Wrong. Yes. No, I it's odd that you're thinking about Najah because I was wondering. We'll talk about it later, yes, about what, you know, when, if was Najah ever translated even in Italian, actually, I don't know, and I looked at it, I never found it. But, um, but the Chirico is really everywhere here. I mean, yeah, you yes, know, landscapes. And so yeah. what is it that he said, I mean, is it really also anti, I mean, can one really follow, I mean, what is, does the, is there a direct relation to the key? I don't know if there's, I mean, it's all, it's, 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 these things are more the pieces to no, me than they are. No, this, yes. Like, but these are like quick sketches yeah. for the, for yeah, the newspaper, yeah. you know, it's, it's yes. the paintings, I suppose. Yeah, yes. So. yes, the last one. I'll have and to then think about, um, this, the hair that is all over, I mean, when you say lack, 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 and then there's this immense, yeah, yeah. The, the hair is huge. It's she enormous, makes, isn't it? She's a huge vagina. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's hair all around. Yeah. It's like she's surrounded with. Look yeah. at that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but she's also a gorgon. I mean, obviously, there's all this mythological thing going on, yeah. right? The yeah, is. yeah. And there's a lot of the other thing I haven't spoken about at all and I haven't come to terms with yet is his. But she's very, a Medusa face. Well, he's very religious. He's extremely religious. Yeah. Particularly mm -hmm. later on when he's ill, he, you know, he spends a lot of time with his priest and he gets a lot of his paintings. He has wonderful, you might know them, but the paintings of Revelations. And they're extraordinary, just mm -hmm. taking this kind of mythological theme and just uh, really going with it, um, mm -hmm. this stuff here, whereas that kind of thing would be much more interesting. Um, so the, the question is, yes, the, the relation to the Kirikor, I mean... And to Brooklyn and to... Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of... There's a strand which comes through from Maria Mafai's partner, Antoine mm -hmm. and uh, Raphael, yeah. right? So she's... Chagall, uh, Soutine, I mean, there's a, there's a whole type of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Eastern European sort of modernism expressions and coming through there, which, yes, probably includes mm -hmm. some of that in there. And I, and I think it's very complex. And, but there is this, you see it in Mafai too, I mean, it's this kind of relationship to Dikitiko, but, but not wanting to be related to him. And it's like a real hump they can't seem to get over. And I think eventually Shibiona gets over it by this extravagant yeah, excessive. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. but you could do Bataille, I mean, I wouldn't do it because I don't care enough about Bataille, but you could do Bataille on, on this stuff because it's just begging. Well, it's the, I mean, it's interesting too that the, uh, these buildings and then Piazza Navarro, I mean, it's the Baroque, it's not only Baroque in style, but it's Baroque in sort of settings, architecture, sculpture, so, and yeah. that's one thing, I mean, I don't, I, I can't remember when De Chirico's sort of first Baroque turn is, but that was one of the aspects uncolonized by metaphysical painting was the, you know, was the Baroque, so that was one of the avenues sort of left to him, I think. I don't know, he liked I don't know what, what Raphael and, um, and, and Nicola think about. I mean, they might have in interesting things. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking about the, the Baroque Rome in relation mm. to the demolitions and this idea of making Rome street straight, mm. yeah, squared. Yeah. 
And I mean, definitely the hermaphrodite theme and the metamorphic idea is, is, is baroque. So Absolutely. once you're painting yeah. this connection mm. between the, the body and the city. Yeah, it's elliptical I space. I mean, Piazza Navona, too, is, you know, it's this very mm. elliptical rather than the quadrato. Yeah. So, in fact, yes, one could take this argument a little bit further in, 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 in the parallel I'm making between the body and the city and really see the body as a kind of, mm. not just a signifier of lack, but in fact of a kind of alternative. And that's what you're saying, Ari, in a way, too. No, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. Is there, yeah. will you go to the siren paint? I mean, is there, is there kind of, I mean, it's just so... Um, I wish I had all the other images of shit. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not, he's not really necessarily pastiching Baroque painting, but it, it does seem, I mean, it would be interesting to delve into kind of the, what the contemporary, because I, to what extent does the Baroque figure into to the kind of fascist imaginary in the early 30s? I mean, is it assimilable to, I mean, David, do you, I mean, as opposed to the, as opposed to kind of the, the Renaissance or, you know, the empire? I mean, where does the Baroque, I mean, you've, you've worked tons on the Baroque. I said no. I mean, I thought no, but I agree that. No, I mean, if we again think, I mean, obviously, look, this whole relation with Mussolini, yes, they live in a very charred sexual Italy under fascism. It's so Baroque is it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, but the Baroque is particularly. Prefer, I mean, it's a misshapen so, pearl, is mm -hmm. the. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, it's. It's well, there grotesque. Are tribes it's grotesque. The Baroque, as there are, like, you know, from the 19th century you know, on, it just becomes the figure of attack. But, you know, there, there are people exhibiting the stuff, and there's you know, El Greco, who Shibane was mad about. He even mm. wrote a little essay about it. Yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's a slight. That's why it, it, it does seem like, it, you know, that, the, that it's worth pursuing this idea that it's not simply these Baroque settings and objects, the Castel Sant'Angelo, you know, the, the Bernini, the Piazza Navona, the, the um, you know, Trajan, the, the churches behind Trajan's column, but also kind of Baroque in. In temperament, in a sense, yeah, I mean, what yeah. that means in the 1930s. And broke in kind of Spirit. embodiment, too. Yeah, it's that sort of thing, too. Yeah, so that's that's right. So that's a really good um, suggestion, thanks. Did he have exhibitions? I mean, was it considered uh, transgressive or was it. Was well, well, that's the crazy thing. thing. You look at the stuff and you think, you know, this is never going to be exhibited. But in fact, yeah. Ogbo, who ran the Quadrina, they loved him. Even though he mm. said, oh, you're going too far, you know, don't, don't go too crazy, or you're going to end up, like, in Israel, you know, terrible racist stuff, right? But he, he also exhibited his work, he promoted him, he protected him, and then after he died, he put on a little retrospective of his work in the 35 Quadrinale. Mm. I mean, Oppo wasn't, you know, all bad. I mean, he actually did promote some good, good artists. And mm. um, Oppo was also the head of the fascist art union, and he was also, you know, pretty well um, prize-winning painting, I mean, you wouldn't look, look at his painting much now, but at the time he was very prominent. Who are your other artists in this book? Tell us a little bit how this fits in the So book. the book is, I, I keep thinking of the word collapse, so there's my idea of the sort of theme of collapse. So there's a kind of collapse in this work, I suppose, in the sense of time almost regressing, going backwards or sort of standing still. And I, I think that, you know, there's a, it's all these sort of time registers. So. Um, and I mean, in some ways, it's similar to what you know we've been talking about. So um, there's a certain, there's some reliance on that work there, um, work that you've done in your previous book, for example, in your moment. The other ones are Di Piero, um, and I'm interested in Di Piero because, particularly because of the way there's a kind of collapse, and not just in a kind of temporal sense, because he fuses sort of mechanic mechanical aesthetic with kind of folkloristic, yes. provincial aesthetic, and it's. I find it quite incongruous, yes. you know, and I think a lot of people find it quite incongruous, and I, so anyway, that's, and that, but also in that, of course, there's the thing about art and advertising, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, mm -hmm. I think he's like the Warhol of the, of, the, of the 20s and 30s, and I think it's really exciting, so again, there's a kind of collapse there, not of time, but more of, you know, genre. just genre, and of also of the object, and what the definition of art is, and, um, uh, so the other artist is, um, so with Di Chirico, I mean, I'm interested in, I was just looking, so the other, so that's Stepero, Scipione, Di Chirico, 
I haven't done much work on him yet. I'm waiting for Ara's book to come out next year, which will be the official, you know, story about what Takiru Ko is. But fortunately, I'm only interested in the yucky looking stuff, not the good stuff that Ara works on. Uh, so from 1920, I'm looking at, you know, Raphael copies, and the collapse there, I suppose, is, is I suppose, in a sense, that of the the fraudulent, you know, into the fraudulent and into the original, and the the the, um, the shattering really of the distinction between a copy and the original. So I mean in, in one of his weird ruminations on ra why Raphael is so good and why all painters should just copy Raphael, you know, DeCuco is saying, when you look at a Raphael portrait, you know, like one of the ones he copied, uh, it looks like, it's so amazing, it looks like I've seen that before somewhere. <laughs> that, and that's why it's so great. And so what I'm arguing is that when, when the Kirko copies Raphael, he makes Raphael look like a plagiarist. That's sort of my argument. So it's a kind of collapse of the distinction between the original and the copy. And when I need to go on and look at the gladiators, I mean, they've been gone over quite a lot, but I think there's a lot more to be said about them. And lastly is um, Radice. Radice. So he's the uh, Mario Radice, he's the Como based abstract artist. There, I think the collapse really is just quite simply that between uh, art and architecture, but in a more interesting way, too. Uh, I'm, I'm interested also in what he did, and in a lot of these artists, I'm interested in their reputations after World War II, and the way in which he edited his own production after World War II by removing the fascist slogans and the fashions, fascist images from his own work so it could be reproduced. There's a sort of revisionism going on in Radice's work after World War II, you know, so he could have his quite radical abstract panels uh, exhibited after World War II, their they, panels in the Casa del Fascio in Como, which had um, holes in them, so you know, like a Fontana in 1905, when before mm. Fontana even thought of doing this. Yeah? Yeah. So mm. then, um, although that's not true in a sense, there was a bit of a relationship, but Fontana once said to Radice, I'm so jealous of you, you know, in 1905. Mm. Um, these holes where you can see the building yeah. through them, and then also there. So the, when he reproduces the photographs in the fifties and sixties, he takes the slogans off the Mussolini statement. So, but what what that means, and there's a sort of it releases a different interpretation of Radice's work, which I think is really interesting, and, and could be compared to Umberto Eco or something like that. And what does that mean for our understanding of the work? So in a long, complicated way, I hope all these different examples will tell a different story about Italian art in the 30s and 20s and also you know just um, think about the, the, the sort of the collapse of the avant-garde as a sort of fatal destiny but also as a sort of positive thing that there could be a kind of productive sense of collapsing the distinctions between various which is an old avant-garde idea um, that, that will also come into it so uh, you're probably sorry I asked that question now because it took Thank long you. to answer <laughs> oh, well, I wanted to know so now you know mm -hmm. <laughs> great Hi. I wanted just to ask you about the, the bringing together sexuality and urban space in the title of your talk, because some of these um, images, like the four you have there of the areas that were going to be demolished. Like these ones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not all those, but, you know, Spinelli Borg on the top right and so on. Yeah. There was demolition around the Colosseum in, in that period, in the 30s. Um, in some ways, there seems to be a tradition here of kind of documenting urban change it goes back to things like Mar Beale's photographs of Free Houseman in Paris in the 1850s, you know, kind of capturing a sort of picturesque recording of a, a Paris that's no longer going to exist. And you get that in Rome in the 1890s with Ettore Ross and France's photographs in watercolours of you know, bits of Rome that were disappearing. Cool. Really? Like, okay, so that's good. I'm going to talk Roma about Sparita. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Roma so, Sparita. You know, there there seems that, yeah. to be a kind of, there seems to be a continuity with that sort of yeah, documentation yeah. of the city in transformation, which doesn't necessarily connect, as far as I can see, with sexuality. And then suddenly, when you get that image of the prostitute in front of Trajan's Forum, mm -hmm. you know, you can see that there is a, yeah, particularly the drawing, I think, on the right, there is a kind of, um, you know, sort of something is happening, there's some kind of interaction between this, as you mm -hmm. say, figure of modernity for much of the avant garde and, and uh, urban transformation, which is, you know, extraordinary, because that, you know, you're, you're 30 years later, you've got Pasolini doing something very similar with the prostitute. And, and, you know, Rome, mm. Rome, and uh, yeah, building cool sites and things. You know, oh, that's cool. interesting. That's yeah, she's so totally Fellini-esque. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 she's much more a Fellini yeah. 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 yeah, well, that's true. Also, I suppose and there's an interesting doc little tiny documentary produced by the Rai yeah. uh, with Moravia speaking about this 
particular painting oh, yeah. he speaks about, mm. you know, a lot. Uh, you know, mm. sort of discovered afterwards he's saying some of the similar things to me, but yeah. not quite connecting it in this, you know, precise way, sorry. But anyway, yeah. I, can, I can see that, you know, sometimes this, this interest he has in hermaphroditism and, you know, various kind of erotic imagery seems to connect up with the urban space, and sometimes the urban mm. space seems to be a, like a separate track of what he's doing. I just wondered whether you think there's always a con interconnection between the two. No, I don't always think there's an interconnection. That's a very good question. So I suppose, um, you know, in my paper today, it was kind of like sexuality <laughs> was a hermaphrodite, and urban space was the, the Roman prostitute, in where the two terms come together. In other works by him, I mean, he has no, you know, it's hard to say there's sexuality in these images. Maybe in these ones. Yeah, yeah. very. Yeah, the paintings in, are very, I mean, they're sexual in their kind of, well, in their you know, treatment. convulsive. Yeah. yeah, in their treatment. But I if think. you look at these ones, I mean, they're... These look like vedute, they look like banal. They do, vedute, they know? do. And, you know, he's, I think he's sort of churning them out in a way. But I wanted to go back and look at every single image because you just, if you do sometimes pick apart the image and really try to check out what was happening in that particular space, in that particular region, it, it may be the case that one turns up ideas of sexuality. I mean, it's hard to say, you know, in these much more conventional scenes, but I'd be interested to learn more about the board god that was knocked down, you know, near the Vatican, because it may have been that, you know, what was actually happening in that precise space at that precise moment. And maybe that, you know, the question is not urban space and sexuality, it might be urban space and class, or it might be urban space and history or architecture or something. It would be nice if there were a few prostitutes, hopefully, <laughs> the board or next yeah, to the exactly. back. Oh, let's oh, hope, oh, let's hope. I'll let's go back and put some in. Oh, yeah, we'll put. I'm not wedded to the idea that all of his work is about <laughs> sexuality. And, and um, But, you know, there's some wonderful still lives. And, you know, still life is a genre that's really prone to sexualized images. And I, there's a wonderful painting by him that shows a couple of objects on a table and an octopus sort of grabbing a photograph of a woman oh. with his tentacles kind of and yeah, I mean it's yeah. just but just, beautiful but just in terms of the city and I mean I think David is right when he, when you know when you think of like Mama Roma the idea of of yeah. this this woman and the, she yeah, is right. kind of the city in that in that image and um, I mean the, the relationship between yeah, the city and the woman's body is something that I think that is where that, that point of convergence, it's a, it's a good point. And it gets back to Raphael's point too about making that kind of, you know, that, that connection sort of more sort of solid and yeah. allegorical or metaphorical, whatever it is. And also I presume that in a way, I don't know, but when Fellini does this or Pasolini, I mean, the French would never do, I mean, it's a kind of an anachron. It's only in Italy. I remember when I was a child, I had this friend who lived in San Giovanni and we would go and Okay, so it was in the 60s, and there were these prostitutes with the big fires. And my father would bring them drive full speed as we were. <laughs> and then the price of how much it cost on the sign for the men crossing. Mm. And they were there with those fires yeah. just not far from the, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, in the center of Rome on the way to San Giovanni. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because yeah. it's something that appears in French painting already in the 80s. 60s, well, 80s, 70s, doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah. the theme of, you know, the house monetization of Paris, et etc. et cetera. Thinking about, like, Notti di Cabiria and all the, I mean, the painted ladies, I mean, and this, you know, Scipione's figure is excess. It's everything, you know, she's added all these different, as you said, different, I mean, and, and what's happening in Rome is the sventramento, it's the exact opposite. It's the stripping down, the taking no, away. No, sventramento is disemboweling. Yeah, and well, it's that, very physical. Isolamento. No, but, but it's, it's, yeah, like but it's, it's void, it's, it's vacuity. No. That's what. Disembowelment, I see in sventramento, I see the body no. everywhere. I think her excess is a, is a kind of reaction formation to what's being taken away, really. I mean, it's true, but you know what I... Isn't it a very sexual... It's a horrible no. thing. It's an art here. No, but the, yes. no the, the, the whole right. idea of, of who's who's something is wrong is what's not. taken away. There's a, but, oh, oh. Okay, but the words ventramento is not one yeah. of yeah. absence. It's Gutting. one of... It's, gu it's all... It's very Of course, in its, in its exact and translation, that's what it is. But isolamento, ventramento, and what was the third term of, of urbanism under... Um, but the, I mean, it's all about taking away, is my point. And, and this is this kind of accrual of different things on her person, as it were, ah, okay. as these things but are kind of disappearing. On her person, on her body. The thing is, too, that I, I have body. to go back over the literature again, but I, I seem to remember reading in the reviews, because I went, one of the methods that I use is just to go back and read every possible review of the guy 
biased work because you think very much for your question. And it appears that these um, you know, strategy of, of, of moving the prostitutes on wasn't actually as successful as the ideologues would have you believe. And I think probably, I'm arguing here that it's sort of a return of something, but I, I think probably it's not quite as simple as that. I think it's a figure who's threatened with removal but is still there kind of hanging on. She's also smiling. I mean, that's the thing. Is she's not this wretched kind of, you know, she's... Yeah, she's a gorgeous. She's, well, she's got one foot in the past and one in the future. Is that... I've, what? It, thank you. Yeah, I have been days. wondering what it means, these mismatched shoes. And yeah, I was hoping so one foot happened. because that's... Steve they're, they're about 50, 50 years... Um, Button up boots. Yeah, that's in the past. And that's a that's modern shoe. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's thank you. That was very simple. One foot. It's a 19th century shoe. Yeah, yeah. 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 because that's the, <laughs> the shoe of the of the 20s and 30s, yes. and that's of the uh, uh, 1600s. Beautiful. Thank oh. you. That's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was some kind of satanic no, thing. No, you know, no, like no. Like she just shows <laughs> where what where she is. You've got well, very visibly one foot in the past. Yeah. One that's mm -hmm. it. That's great. Yeah. That works. But the one of the past is the one that comes forward. Wow. Well, that's true. <laughs> so even better. And do you like my argument about a truncated collar and the handkerchief and everything? Yeah. Keep with that. Is that good? <laughs> well, a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Everybody.